an essay on economic theory, an English translation of Richard Cantillon's Essay sur la nature de commerce en général, translated by Chantal Saussier, edited by Mark Thornton, narrated by Million Quinteros. Forward by Robert F. Hebert Following a century of neglect, William Stanley Jevons, in the first blush of discovery, proclaimed Cantillon's essay, The Cradle of Political Economy. Subsequent growth and development of economic thought has not really alerted us to the subtleties of this succinct appraisal. A cradle holds new life, and there can be little doubt that the essay added new life to the organizing principles of economics. But political economy does not accurately describe the subject Cantillon addressed. Indeed, he scrupulously avoided political issues in order to concentrate on the mechanics of 18th century economic life. When confronted by extraneous factors such as politics, Cantillon insisted that such considerations be put aside so as not to complicate our subject, he said, thus invoking a kind of ceteris paribus assumption before it became fashionable in economics to do so. This is merely one way in which Cantillon was ahead of his time. He preceded Adam Smith by a generation. Both writers made important foundational contributions to economics, but from perspectives that were quite different. Smith was a philosopher and educator. His approach to economics reflected the concerns and approaches of philosophic inquiry stretching back to Thomas Hobbes. The Hobbesian dilemma was how to secure peace and prosperity without submitting to an all-powerful central government. Smith gave an answer based on the nature and function of an exchange economy operating under a rule of law. The wealth of nations is full of useful advice to those who hold political power. Hence, Smith earned his sobriquet, Father of Political Economy. Cantillon was a businessman and banker. His approach to economics reflected the concern of practical men who set about making a living, and his analysis concentrated on the structure and mechanics of an emerging market economy. The economy he described was an enterprise economy, not a political one, in which certain individuals played key roles, some passive and some active. Government as we know it was relatively passive in Cantillon's economy. The most active and central participant was the entrepreneur who motivates the entire economic system. Unlike any previous writer, Cantillon explicated the vital role of the entrepreneur with perception and vigor. Hence, he deserves to be called the father of enterprise economics. These considerations alone would justify renewed interest in Cantillon and his work. But there have always been impediments to overcome. We know little of Cantillon's life and the circumstances of his authorship. The manuscript that was eventually published in 1755 circulated privately in France for almost two decades before. When published, it appeared under mysterious circumstances. The designated publisher Fletcher Giles never existed at the address given, and despite the phrase Traduit de Langlois on the title page, no English original was ever found. Moreover, a statistical supplement to the essay has gone missing and has never been discovered. In the 1970s, a Japanese scholar unearthed a French manuscript at a municipal library in Rouen bearing the title Essai de la nature de commerce en général which encouraged speculation that the first word may have been carelessly transcribed from an English original, still undiscovered. All of this has given economic detectives much to sift through and explain. But the one steadfast realization throughout has been the power of Cantillon's analysis. Mark Thornton and Chantal Saussier have accomplished the arduous task of bringing forth a new and improved translation of Cantillon's famous work. Heretofore, the only English translation of the essay available has been the 1931 edition produced by Henry Higgs for the Royal Economic Society. Though competent, it has become less serviceable over time as more and more of its shortcomings devolved, not the least of which is the antiquated use of undertaker in place of entrepreneur. Saussier provides a more accurate and lucid account, better suited to the 21st century. Thornton's hand shows not only incompetent guidance of the translator, but in the inclusion of numerous explanatory footnotes that add historical context. Aged has dimmed my memory of the exact hour and day, but when I was much younger I presented a paper on Cantillon to a small group of economists gathered in Keynes Hall at Cambridge University. Afterward, I was approached by a proper English gentleman who wished to discuss further the merits of Cantillon's work. During the ensuing conversation, I mentioned my belief that the new translation of the essay was warranted. My listener enthusiastically agreed.
At some point it dawned on me that he had not mentioned his name. So I asked. Shackle, he replied. I was momentarily stunned. G.L.S. Shackle, 1903 to 1992, was Britain's leading intellect on the themes that are central to Cantillon's analysis, namely imagination and uncertainty. If he were alive today, I'm sure Shackle would welcome this new translation, alongside the rest of us who have an abiding interest in Cantillon 